everyone, this is George Cross, and welcome back to another monthly recap of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And I was thinking about, I like to do these little intros just to kind of get you warmed up. And I was thinking about that. I haven't done Mindset Monday yet this year, and I'm thinking about it. I haven't committed to it yet. I'm just thinking about maybe a little mini Mindset Monday <laughs> before we get into the introduction. And so I don't even know if it's Monday if I post this, but it's just Mindset Monday. So I was listening to something the other day and it was from someone, a weightlifter, bodybuilder, I don't know, someone who was in the gym and they shared something I thought it was really interesting. And they said, don't get in the mentality where you're trying to prove others wrong, that they doubted you. Don't even try to get in the mentality that you're trying to prove yourself wrong, that there's something that you can't do. The mentality that you have is that you need to prove yourself right. That the things that you believe that you truly can achieve, the places that you can go, prove yourself right, get to that point. And I feel that was such a much more aspirational because I've had this time in my life where I was like always trying to prove myself to others and things that they doubted that I could do and just showing them up. But I think this mentality gives you a vision of where not only you, where you could go, but where you should go. Gives you something to reach to. And I just thought that was such a really powerful message that really how do we prove ourselves right? But setting those lofty goals, setting those big aspirations. And a lot of times that just takes doing one step at a time, one step in front of the of another. And a, a story I've shared many times when I run and I really struggle is when I go up hills. And hills can be overwhelming, exhausting. But you see the top of that hill and you know you can get there. But a lot of times when I actually focus on the top of that hill, I get so overwhelmed that I just feel like I can't go anymore. And so what really helps me is literally looking about two, three feet in front of me and just watching my feet go one after another. And then you start to not notice the hill, but then eventually you're at the top of it. And it's that ability that I know you can get there. And sometimes you get so overwhelmed with a goal, the best way to reach it is just put one step in front of the other. And I thought that was a really inspirational message that I saw. It's not mine, but I wanted to share it with you because I think it's really powerful. And it's a great way to set up this podcast for the month. You're going to hear some really great guests. And I encourage you to subscribe on YouTube. Leave a comment below. It is always wonderful when, especially the guests I have, hear something that resonated with them, with you, the audience that stuck with them. A lot of times we hear great things, but we don't tell them. So if you could just leave a comment below something from this episode and who is from that resonate with you, what stuck with you, I know that I would appreciate it and so would they. But welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. When we think about limitless mindset, when we think about limitless lifestyle or limitless leadership, what we're saying is that the old mental model, the old sound bites, the old mm -hmm. things that people, that society, that the media and that the world try to tell me about what is inside me, whether it's my gift, whether it's my talent, whether it's my potential, or whether it's just simply an idea that's just crazy enough to work. Mm -hmm. When you are told you're too old, when you were told you were too young, when you were told you're not in the right industry or that you don't have the right background or that you didn't go to the right school or you don't have the right degree, we are literally stopping people from optimizing their limitless potential in our schools, in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, and in our living rooms every single day. So what Limitless Mindset says is that I have to really come face to face with all of the things I've been told that put a cap on me. So whether you're a multi-passionate teacher who you may be a phenomenal educator, but you have hobbies and interests that impact the world and that people are always calling on you to be able to share with groups of children or even adults, or maybe you're a principal who has a fantastic idea that could revolutionize your district or revolutionize your state. How are we creating spaces where people feel safe in being limitless? And that is why I created The Limitless Lady, because everything about that statement is almost oxymoronic, because as women, 
particularly as women of color, we are told that you can go this far and no further, or you can do this, but you can't do this, or you can say this, but definitely don't say that. And when we have created spaces, particularly myself, I have been the only for so many opportunities in my life. I've been either the only woman or the only young person or the only woman of color or the only educator. Sometimes when you stand in your voice, you don't realize that you release people, you give them permission to be free. And so as we go into 2023, a limitless school leader looks like creating spaces where students and teachers and even your superintendents and boards can see the potential past the standards, past curriculum and instruction, past professional development, where teachers feel safe, where students are excited about their new ideas and we embrace them and we bake those in to the things we did in yesteryear that work, but they don't meet the needs of today. As much as I appreciate you, Brian, and know you'd be like a super fun science teacher, I guarantee that not every kid is like jacked up about science yeah. when they leave. But I think you talked about that. You really want them to be great at like learning and life and things like that too. And if you can do that, there's, there's, a, and, and I yeah. think, I think it's like, I think that for me, what is, was a really important point you made before we even got on the podcast, because I, I have an appreciation for science knowing oh. I still struggle with it, but there are so many things that there is other science teachers I had who really got me excited about learning yeah. outside of science, if that makes sense. And so like, yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that philosophy. Yeah, yeah sure. so I mean, I, I really think that the the main the main goal, at least that I try and do in my classroom, and and I, I guarantee you most teachers feel the same way, is like you want to make sure that those students that you see, whether it's a year or whether you're lucky enough to like loop, I get to loop with some of my kids each year. Um, yeah. The, the main goal in the back of my head is, you know, even if you don't like my subject, I want to teach you to, to arm yourself with those that toolkit of, of strategies, of, of different things that when you leave my room, you will be able to apply, whether it's in other classrooms or like thinking long term, like your career. So, I, I you know, when we talk about kids, you want to make them a whole package to package out to send out into the world, whether that's like thinking about empathy, whether that's thinking about like those hard and soft skills, like when you're talking about interviews, presentations, anything that you can do mm -hmm. to just help them excel and exceed in life. Um, and and I, I told, you know, George, before we got on here, I said, you know, quite honestly, my, my curriculum in the grand scheme of things, I, I don't really think matters. Like, because they're going to have science again. Right. And when they get to college, they probably will have some sort of science again. My, my main goal is to make sure that I hit on everything they have to offer as a person so that when they leave, they know they're more confident with what they have to offer and can give in life really there's actually a, a concept that i talked about in innovators mindset it was called competitive collaboration and i i i am like i i think we do this too much in education we swing pendulums to like crazy sides right so it's like when i was uh, a kid in school uh basically we did math drills and you would like compete against each other and you try to like you know crush everybody in your time tables and be the best at time tables and now it's like, we don't necessarily want to do that. We want everyone to like, it's just like an overemphasis on collaboration. And I actually, I, I think collaboration's good. I think a little competition's good. So I really was drawn to that term. And when you hear the term competitive collaboration, uh, one of the analogies that I utilized was there was these two biology classrooms and they were different schools and the teachers wanted that their class to be the best, right? So they were actually utilizing a shared hashtag uh, to show like what was going on in their classroom. And so th the kids would connect with each other, you know, in these classrooms through this hashtag. And one of the kids from one class say like, oh, I saw this class is doing this. And the teacher's like, yeah, well, we're, we're gonna do something better. And they would actually push each other. But the reason I love the, the notion of competitive collaboration, it, the two teachers work together as well. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, I'm going to have the best class. Yours is going to suck and we're going to crush it. It was like, Hey, we're pushing each other 
And so I want to do really well, but if you need anything, I'm always here for you. So it's kind of like that kind of back and forth. So like when, when we were talking about that, I was, I was really kind of drawn to that notion of competitive collaboration, because I think there, there is a balance of both of that. Hey, I want the best for my kids, but I want the best for all kids. And that means we push each other and, you know, uh, we su supported one each other, one another as well. And so the last question I ask you, this is uh, airing. Yeah, 2023, this is a question I've been asking uh, all my guests, you know, so last couple of years, you know, <laughs> that we don't talk about uh, have been, you know, very all over the place. So as people end, you know, enter 2023, what is something, you know, something they can focus on? What's something that, you know, they're, what they can look forward to in this year, or, you know, something that we could focus on to, to grow as, as individuals and as organizations? Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, as, as I look into to 2023 and, and I look at, you know, to me, one of the biggest issues is keeping good people in the profession. Uh, that, that and, and, and what you talked about as far as collaboration and even mm -hmm. any kind of collaboration or competitive collaboration, that, that you... You, you do all you can to support those that are still with us and to keep them from getting, because, because things are being piled on to, to right. teachers more and more and more. And there's, there, I, and I would say have this strong sense of purpose that, that if, you know, the thing I'm, I'm recognizing about the teacher leaders and, and I coached, I coached a lot of administrators and, and coaching teacher leaders is different in that, what you feel from them is a sense of a purpose. They all know why they're there and they're there for kids. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and so what they, they are willing to, to have critical conversations with administrators about what's going on in the school. I mean, th that's, that's where we, we need to find a way for leaders who are, who are natural leaders and committed and have a purpose to love kids to do that and stay in the classroom, George. I I, I don't know the answer to that, but but I think it can be done. Uh, you know, I think it needs to be done. So I would just want to raise the level of teacher retention and, and teacher appreciation and uh, and going to back and, and, and as an administrator, get out of their way, make things easier for them rather than harder for them. I mean that that could be your one job. I'm, I'm breaking down the barriers so you can do your job, teacher. Well, you know, we went to school in different, you know, decades when we were kids. And I've always said this, probably the time frame of our school day was almost exactly the same, even though we went to school in different decades. But the expectations upon teachers just keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and you're like, you're expected to do more, but in the same amount of time. And so that starts filtering out outside of school, you know, after and things like that. So you know, based on your advice, one thing I always tell administrators is if you're going to add something on to the plate of teachers, you should be able to take one to two things off, right? You, you have to identify that because even if you, if you don't explicitly say that, and maybe implicitly you're, you, you know, you mean that they, they have to, they have to know this is not, okay. Hey, we're going to move forward with this, but we're, we're like, this is, we're done with this. We don't need to do this anymore. And so really being thoughtful of that uh, in that process. And if you, if you, if you can't take one to two things off, then don't add one to two things like that. That to me yeah. is a really important aspect, yeah. right? Then, then and, and as a coach, I coach the teachers who are leaders who they keep piling on to go back to their administrators and say, sir, uh, I'm doing this, this, and this, and you're adding this to, right. I need you to take something off. So, so they both yeah. have this. I mean, that's why I, I coach yeah. them. I, I do a lot of, Let's let's plan a crucial conversation yep. with your principal because they're they're yep. they're 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 swallowed up they're, yep. they're burdened down you know and they get discouraged and and uh, and I I don't want them to leave <laughs> and I, yeah and I appreciate you saying that because I I would say this to my staff all the time I cannot solve a problem I don't know exists and I think sometimes uh, some people are listening to this right now and they're like yeah I wish my administrator knew that tell them say something like, Hey, I heard this advice. Like even just take this, take this snippet of the podcast, 
share like, Hey, what do you think about this? Like maybe, maybe you don't want to say it, but maybe we just said it for you. And maybe that will help get somebody out there as well. I've run marathons, uh, years ago. And I always say this, that the hardest part of a marathon is actually not the marathon is the training. The training is really, really tough. And if you do it in a proper way, by the time you get to the marathon, that should be not easy, but a lot easier than if you didn't do it. And so I decided that I was kind of floating in some of the things that I was doing with my exercise. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a 14 week half marathon training and just jump into week seven. Cause I feel like my, my fitness is at a level where I, I probably could, you know, uh, be at the point where I'm okay with week seven. And what's been beautiful about this process is I don't really think about what I have to do. I don't say like, ah, maybe I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do this. I, I know, you know, basically seven weeks ahead what I'm going to do, you know, Friday, uh, you know, five, six weeks from now. And it's, it's been really helpful to me because it, it takes away that choice of what I get to do. And so I don't really debate it at all. I just, I, I don't really worry about how do I feel that day? What's the weather like? Any of that stuff. I just, I've committed to this. I'm going to do it. And what's interesting, I don't actually have any race that I'm planning to run. I just wanted to do the training. And if a race happens to be close to that time, great. But it's not my focus. I, I do have a goal of a time that uh, I want to run in and uh, to, fi- to complete a half marathon. And so if I do that just solo, if I actually enter a race, uh, I'll, I'll kind of figure that out. And it is kind of tweaking some of these things that I've been doing because while I do half marathon training, you know, going back to my advice earlier, well, I do half marathon training, um, you know, seven, you know, seven months from now. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But what I, I think I'm trying to learn through this process is having those, you know, specific goals of what I'm going to do. So I don't kind of float. And so I make really good use of my time. Uh, when I exercise, when I make better use of my time, the time seems to go quicker and I'm more efficient with it. And I think that's what I'm trying to figure out you know, through this process. So that's a little bit, I'm doing some of that stuff, but I'm also, you know, taking a little time to write each day. uh, And when I feel inspired to create something, and I I feel that is um, what I'm doing right now. 